Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin made a surprise visit to Kiev yesterday. But is this just White House cope over the fact that their de-escalation policy has failed so epically? I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. Let's talk about this. Okay, so this the overall contours of the story are this. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin arrived in Ukraine on an unannounced visit. This is, of course, pretty standard security procedure, right? This is not likely not an unplanned visit. This is, uh, but I strongly suspect that it was probably planned uh, shortly after the announcement of North Korean troops entering Ukraine, or at least when U.S. intelligence realized that was happening, because the Ukrainians likely want some reassurance from their largest and most powerful partner. Uh, now, of course, Lloyd Austin showing up, right? They don't want to give the Russians notice that there's going to be a U.S. defense secretary in uh, Kiev, though, as we've talked about, uh, it's actually likely that within about 24 hours of his arrival the or, or prior to his arrival the russians were notified to say hey listen uh don't do something stupid that will escalate this war in a direction we can't stop but this alone is just just sort of what kills me right and and, and we'll talk about why so austin met with you with Zelensky and the ukrainian defense minister umerov uh to discuss ukraine's weapons needs and how the u.s can continue to support the country's military over the next year now, this is from a small group of reporters uh that traveled with the secretary to kiev um Secretary said it was also a moment to, quote, step back and look at the arc of the U.S.-Ukraine relationship over the last two and a half years, right? And, of course, the secretary noted that things in Ukraine are very tough uh, heading into the winter. Um, and this is sort of the... Uh, it's hard to read sort of the tea leaves here. Uh, Lloyd also also said, quote, under President Biden's leadership, the United States remains committed to keeping up this support. Uh, and I'm pleased to announce today a commitment of $400 million presidential drawdown package to provide your forces with munitions, armored vehicles, and anti-tank weapons. And one of the things that I always talk about, guys, is a presidential drawdown package is not the same thing as $400 million of, tax, of taxpayer spend. It is taxpayer spend of leftover war munitions. That is what a drawdown, presidential drawdown authority grants them. It says, listen, if the military is retiring gear, the president has the right to give it to somebody, right? Just like if you go and decide to replace your 1996 Toyota Corolla with something less reliable like a Tesla, then you have the, the president in this case, or in this scenario, you would, could give your Toyota Corolla to your little brother and say, listen, this bad boy still has a few hundred thousand miles on it, so you should take care of it. And that's what we're doing. We're saying, listen, we bought all this shit basically for the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, you guys want some of it? And the Ukrainians are like, yes. So again, when when you see them cope about your taxpayer money being spent in Ukraine, if, or if your uncle at Thanksgiving starts to roll out those talking points, you can remind them, that that $400 million was actually spent on Iraq and Afghanistan, and it just so happens to be being put to better use, right? So this, these sort of statements are cryptic, but also I don't, let, there's some stuff in here that I don't love, right? One, Austin's like, it's remarkable that Ukraine's been able to do what it's done, implying that yeah, it's been able to do that, of course, because we have supported them from the very beginning. We've rallied, rallied 50 countries to be a part of that support. So what he's saying is, man, you guys did a good job, which sounds a little bit like, like you've already exceeded expectations, so don't worry about winning, right? And they say, and it's a reminder to say, listen, you only were able to do this because of what we've done, right? Again, in part, the U.S. seems like they may be going there to say, listen, there's a limit to what you can ask us to do. And this kind of annoys me. Uh, in fact, it very much annoys me. Um, and as CNN points out, right, the path to Ukrainian victory is pretty murky. Uh, and it's a little true. But again, okay, okay. Let's, I'm going to break down my feelings on this because I just, I'm limited in like how much I can tolerate it. But here's the thing, guys. Where the U.S. support, I think, falters, uh, we show up. And I mean you, the viewer, and me, 
right? We've partnered with Ukraine Aid Ops. This is a U.S. registered 501c3 charity, totally tax deductible, that raises money for drones, drone jammers, and more for Ukrainian units. And this fundraiser is critical because we are supporting the units who are defending Pokrovsk against Russian advances. We know that Putin has personally ordered the Russian military to take Pokrovsk by the end of September. So already the Russian MOD is three weeks behind schedule, thanks to the tremendous efforts of the 25th and 14th brigades. And so we're going to help them out. We're going to raise money for drones, drone jammers, range extenders, power stations, anything they need, right? And because it's a 501c3, it's tax deductible, but here's the best, the two best parts. One, if you donate enough, more or less, 250 is about a uh, one FPV drone. If you donate enough to buy a drone or two, they'll send you unit patches as a, as a thank you, which is pretty sick. Uh, right. As I always joke, right. I've got to accrue more dad lore and there's no dad lore like saying, dad, why do you have 16 patches from Ukrainian infantry brigades? And you go, well, let me tell you, but here's the real thing. If we can raise a hundred grand, I will deliver the drones to the units myself. Yeah, that's right. So if you want to send me to the front lines of Ukraine, uh, you know, make those donations, right? We'll raise the money. We'll get these units what they need and we'll stick it to Putin and not let him get his aspirational goal of Pokrovsk. Now, let's talk about this. Listen, I've been dancing around this all video. Here's my gripe. My gripe is that the U.S. has had this policy that said, we'll help you out, but... We're not going to, but there's limits, right? We're, we're going to help you out in these specifically delineated ways. And the problem is that one, this, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a referendum on a reshaped world order, right? One of the things that the examples that I give is the Spanish civil war, right? Spanish civil war took place just a few years before the outbreak of world war II, right? It took place in the mid to late 30s. And in that, you had two sides. You had the Spanish military who expressly were like, we are fascists. We believe in fascism. And you had the Spanish Republicans who said, we believe in a, an electoral democracy, right? And the, the world looked at this, particularly Europe. They said, listen, fascism has a lot of, they say a lot of things about how powerful they are, but can they really beat electoral democracies? Right. And the Spanish Republicans on their side, they had the UK, they had the United States, they had France, they had all of these democratic countries who at least paid lip service to supporting them in addition to the Soviet Union. And on the other side, the Spanish military, the fascists, they had Germany. Right. And what happened? Well, the answer is that the Republicans got their asses kicked. Why? Because their allies, their allies offered them milk toast support, right? The Soviet Union was the only country that contributed actual military aid. Everyone else contributed a little bit of money, uh, did some condemnations, some sanctions, right? They they did a bunch of half-assed nonsense for, as their, and that constituted their support. In contrast, right, the uh, Germany of the 1930s right? Run by the guy who will get me demonetized if I say his name, that Germany. They sent whole ass military units. The entire, uh, nearly the entire Spanish air force was, was German pilots. They were sent there to try out the Germans, new tactics, strategies, and gear, right? They did, uh, they provided an insane level of support, equipment, literal boots on the ground, right? And so the globe saw this and they said, yo, when the Spanish, when the Republicans lost, the rest of the globe said, you know what? Democracies are weak. Human rights are, make you weak. A commitment to things like freedom of speech or the right to vote or multiple parties, they just make countries weak and pathetic. And they're going to lose to countries with strong dictators who can, who don't respect human rights. And the fear or if, if fear is even light, that's, I think, what's happening in Ukraine now. People are looking and saying, listen, what does it mean when the West commits to supporting somebody? 
What does it mean when they say, hey, the West it backs you up, right? And what does it mean when an autocratic country, right, a dictatorship like Putin's, right? And look at his friends, North Korea, Iran, China, all countries run by dictators. What happens when they beat the shit out of a country that is backed by the West? What does that say for the rest of the world? What does that message that send China, who says, we want to take Taiwan, we want the Spratleys, we want all, every landmass in the South China Sea, right? It says that while the West's support is you know, financial and political, at the end of the day, it's not that serious. The West's support is always weaker than sincere, actual commitments. Again, North Korea is willing to send 10,000 troops, fund all their artillery shells. How is North Korea providing more committed support to Russia and Putin than the entire Western world can provide to Ukraine? That's what irks me here, right? Is the lack of commitment by the White House. And here's the thing, the White House, part of the reason they've said, we don't want this to, exp we don't want to go all in. And they, they always have, guys. The, the lines have always moved as they've always moved though only in response to Putin, right? The, we used to say, the, the US said, well, we don't allow Ukraine to strike into Russia because that's Russian territory. We don't want this war to escalate. What happened? Well, Putin took advantage of that. He exploited it, clearly using it as a loophole to mass troops on the Ukrainian border and then push them into Kharkiv, right? And, the, and so the West said, well, okay, you played this game, right, where you just dared us to hit you. Now we're going to have to change our policies. But it happened only after Putin raised the stakes, after Putin escalated. And now it's happening again, right? We've used all these little tools. We've slow walked our aid to Ukraine. And now we have got a situation where North Korea has committed its own soldiers to this fight. That was the entire point of all of this, guys, was to not turn this war into a, a, a war with a bunch of belligerents. And yet here we are, the war did become one with a bunch of belligerents, but it was done on Putin's timetable. Putin was the one who got to decide, not anyone else, right? And here's what bothers me, right? It, it, the US, right, we don't need to send the 82nd Airborne dropping it onto Moscow. If the U.S. was willing to say, listen, Ukraine, we are willing to provide a Bosnia-style air campaign to eliminate Russian forces in eastern Ukraine. We'll give you F-35s, and we won't give you. We will operate F-35s and F-22s to hit targets. You can make recommendations. We will, we will confirm the targets. They're stealth aircraft. They're going to walk right through Russian air defenses. And yet, right, we don't, we don't do that. Why? Because Putin's going to escalate. What does that mean? What's he going to do? Draw in North Korea again? Right? Maybe it's time the U.S. actually supported its allies instead of this, this deferring, letting dictators dictate how the U.S. runs. So this is this is what aggravates me about the White House. I think the White House is starting to is coming to the reality that it's half-assing things, it's half-ass support, right? Is is so inadequate. And and don't get me wrong, I'm also reserved some some condemnation for Europe. The problem is Europe doesn't have anything to give. They don't have a ar domestic arms manufacturing. They don't have a large, sophisticated military. They don't have presidential drawdown authority. They don't, uh, Germany, at the start of this invasion, Germany had less than 100 working tanks. They had no working aircraft, no combat aircraft that could fly. And so you sit there and go, well, they have nothing to give because they can't even defend themselves. So this is, the reality that we've sort of boxed ourselves into. And so I'm sort of mad because in this presidential election, there are two options. There's the guy who says, just give Putin what he wants. He seems pretty serious, guys, right? These dictators, they really, you know, they're really committed, guys. I think we should just bail. They're really tougher than we are. That is that is Trump's unironic stance. He literally was like, you don't understand. Putin will fight forever. Like, dude, we're the United States. We, we won the Cold War, right? Two, you've got Kamala Harris who says, we're going to keep slow walking aid. We're just going to gradually trickle it in, right? One's better. 
It's better to support you, your friends than to fuck them. But you know what's best is to actually show up for your friends. Actually show up. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a crazy person. But again, people are like, oh, you're a warmonger. Oh, you're warmongering. Guys, I got bad news for you, right? I'm not looking. F- the, 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 the war is here. The war has happened, guys. The war is going on. The question is, are you going to win the war or lose the war? That's the decision, right? Yeah, I, the, my preferred outcome is no war. But that outcome, that ship sailed, guys. So the question is, what kind of war are you going to be left with? What kind of victory are you going to have? Anyway, guys, that's all I had. Thank you to Bill Collier, Robert Colburn, Guys Marning, Eugene Acquesta, Chris Gorsuch, Francis Carius, L90, and Petra Tororu, as well as all of our Lieutenant Tier members. Couldn't do this without you guys. Thank you so much. Be sure to check the link in the description for the Ukraine Aid Ops fundraiser. See ya. Cheers.